Okay, we are continuing this morning a study we started about three weeks ago called Baptism Unwatered Down. And I know some of you may think, well, baptism, that's, uh, that's, pretty, that's a pretty basic topic. Um, this, is, uh, this is pretty fundamental stuff. And in some ways it is very basic and fundamental. But I think over the course of the weeks of this particular study, uh, you are going to learn some things that you did not know, did not realize, and is going to fortify even more in your minds what the Bible teaches about baptism. Not, not what does the Church of Christ teach about baptism. There's no such thing as what the Church of Christ teaches about baptism. And if there was, it wouldn't be worth anything. It's what does the Bible teach about this. And, and I, want us, I just want us to look at what the text says, not follow anybody's tradition on this, uh, not try to... Uh, not try to just keep on saying what somebody else has always taught, but what, is, what does the text say? So just as a sort of as a way of reminder, but also as a, as a way of introduction, when we get into this topic of, of baptism, what, what are we talking about? Uh, essentially, we are talking about um, a vitally important subject because this is a subject that we find in the Bible. If the Bible teaches something, that makes it important, right? Uh, now, what do you know about baptism that's not in the Bible? What truth can you know about baptism uh, that, that we're not going to find in the Bible? It is our source. Uh, it is our document uh, to go to for everything that God wants us to know about this topic. We saw three weeks ago that by definition, baptism is an immersion in water. That's not, that's not a church doctrine. That's just what the word means. And in every account in the New Testament of those who were baptized, they were immersed in water. Ephesians 4 and verse 5 specifies that there is only one baptism. There's not multiple ones. There's not uh, a variety to choose from. God specified there's one baptism, and that one baptism is uh, Christ's baptism of the Great Commission when, that we're going to look at one of those passages this morning in Matthew chapter 28. But what we also saw a few weeks ago is that somehow the Bible ties baptism to our relationship with God. So we've got to figure out what is that relationship. What, what, how, what does the Bible teach ties m- baptism and my relationship with God? What, what, what does it teach about that? What's the purpose of somebody being baptized? What does it have to do with my salvation if it's got anything to do with it? So uh, this, is a, uh, this is a serious topic, obviously, for us to study, and we've got to find uh, some the Bible truth on this. So here's, here's what we put up three weeks ago. These are the uh, 91 verses in the New Testament where we find a BAPT word. Uh, a BAPT word, baptized, baptizes, baptized, uh, Baptist, whatever it may be. 115 times you're going to find a BAPT word in these 91 verses. And that you remember if you were here three weeks ago, we went through the seven baptisms that the New Testament talks about. Talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, talks about the baptism of John, talks about the baptism of suffering, talks about the baptism of fire, talks about baptism for the dead, uh, and um, missing one in that list, uh, talks about baptism into Moses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So it talks about seven baptisms, and so what we did as we went through that study before is to say none of those are the one baptism that Ephesians 4 and verse 5 talks about. Uh, and so what we did is we talked about each of those and said, okay, that's not the one, that's not the one, that, that's not the one. And so what we did is in eliminating those other passages, this is what is left of those 91 verses. Um, this is what is left, and this is just verses that have a B-A-P-T word in them. We are going to study other verses uh, over the course of this study that don't have a B-A-P-T word in them, but it's still talking about baptism. Is it possible that you can talk about baptism without using a B-A-P-T word? Sure. Uh, Can you talk about your husband without using the word husband? Yeah, most of you do. Can you talk about your wife without using the word wife? Yeah, there's there's other words that you can talk about your deer and your honey and your babe, the nice words that you use for your husband and for your wife. But you may not use the word husband. Same thing when you talk about baptism. There's other words you can use uh, without necessarily using a B-A-P-T word. So we're going to look at some of those, but these are the verses. These, this, these are the verses that we're going to spend time, especially uh, looking at. And this morning, we are going to be focusing in on that first one in Matthew chapter 28 uh, and verse 19. So I want you to get your Bibles open, and if if you think this is going to be a uh, just kind of a fundamental, basic study 
and you've heard all of this before, uh, I'm going to challenge you this morning uh, because I don't think that's true. I think you will learn some things this morning uh, and, uh, and be glad that you, were, uh, that you were here to study this. So, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is the New King James Version. Your version may read a little bit different, and we're going to point out one particular translation in a little bit uh, in how it reads. But this begins in verse 18 by Jesus came to them and spoke. What do we commonly call these verses? This is the Great Commission. These are the last words of Jesus before He ascends into heaven. We talk about this sometimes, but do we assign great value to the last words that somebody might speak when they're on this earth? Do we hang on to those words? The last thing that somebody said to me while they were on this earth. Here's the last thing uh, that Jesus said, and, and, and and it's tied right here. Uh, in these verses. But in verse 18, Jesus begins this by saying, all authority has been given to me. The Great Commission starts off with Jesus talking about His authority, His power to command, and you get down to verse 20 and He says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. He's got the authority to command because He has all authority. Everything we do has got to be done by the authority of Christ. That's what Colossians 3 and verse 17 says. We are all going to stand before Jesus on the day of judgment and to give an account, including how we have responded to what He says in the Great Commission. Uh, And so the Great Commission starts off with the authority of Jesus. And then in verse 19, you got the word, therefore. And when Jesus gives us the Great Commission, go and preach and baptize people, The word therefore says this is based upon what? The authority of Jesus. This is not just some random concept that uh, that man is making up here. This is based upon the authority of Jesus. And so how man responds, how you and I as Christians respond to the making of disciples, how you and I as Christians respond to going and preaching and teaching others, how we respond to that is a reflection of our respect for the authority of Jesus. As a Christian, if I don't go and teach and preach, that reflects on what I think about the authority of Jesus. But at the same time, whether someone chooses to be baptized or not reflects upon what they think about the authority of Jesus. That's, that's, that's the foundation of the Great Commission. When Jesus says here, and there's other translations that don't say make disciples here, but that's literally what this states here, is that Jesus commands His disciples to go and make disciples. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in just a minute, but it is important for you to know that this is the main verb. I might call it the leading verb, and I'm using that term interchangeably, so if I don't call it the main verb, I might call it the leading verb in this sentence. But that's important for you to know is that when Jesus is giving the Great Commission in Matthew 28, the main verb here is He's telling His disciples, go and make disciples. So His purpose here is not only talking about the teaching that's to be done down in verse 20, but what is the purpose of that teaching? The purpose of that teaching is making disciples, and this is a command. The the make disciples here is a Greek imperative indicating this is a command of God. I should have mentioned at the beginning here, there's going to be more on the screen than what you can take notes. Some of you are very good at taking notes, and there's going to be more on the screen today than what you're going to have time to write. And I somewhat apologize for that, but I want to make sure you have the information. You can get these slides online later. At the very end of this particular study, uh, when we are done with all of these lessons, uh, we'll have all of this information available to you uh, in print Uh, But the leading verb here, the command is, go and make disciples. And then at the very end, Jesus says that, that, uh, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Was Jesus' plan going to change? After after some time passed, would would things develop and, and He allow a different plan of salvation? No. 
unto the end of the age indicates that just as long as Jesus' presence would be with his disciples, how long would he be with them? Always, even to the end of the age. Just as long as his presence would be with his disciples, this teaching would abide. This teaching would endure. It was not going to be changed. It was not going to be updated by any, in, in any form. And so that's just, that's just what I... Th this first slide here is just some preliminary observations that I want you to have just about the overall view of this text as we put it into its context, as we look at the overall structure uh, of, uh, of this passage. Those are some important things for us to understand. Now, what place does baptism have in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? I'm going to give you about five, I think five points, about five points, five major points this morning. And uh, unless... Uh, Unless you've done some study or unless you've been a part of a class like this before, uh, I think there'll be some things in here that you will find new and uh, intriguing and hopefully helpful to us uh, in our study. First thing is I find interesting, and that is that baptism is singled out by Jesus. Uh, Jesus gives, and as, as you read through this text, Jesus gives baptism a unique place. I mean, think about it. How long, how, how many verses long is the Great Commission? As you've got it here, you've got verse 19 and 20. If you add verse 18, you've got three verses. This is kind of a short commission. I mean, it's, it's not like Jesus goes into an hours-long uh, diatribe about what he wants them to do. This is, a, this is a rather short, concise statement about what he wants them to do. So it's not significant that in this short concise statement that Jesus makes to his disciples that he includes baptism in it. He could have included anything. If, if Je since Jesus has all authority, could he have included anything he wanted to in the Great Commission? Go therefore and make disciples. Uh, well, how do you make a disciple? Make them wash the dishes. Could, could, he, could he have made a condition of salvation washing dishes? Could he have done that? Be like, no, he would He's got, how much authority does he have? All authority. He could have included anything he wanted. Now, he could have excluded anything he wanted. Could he have excluded baptism from the planet? He's got all authority. He could put anything he, in that he wants. He can, he can take anything out that he wants. And so it's of significance that we have Jesus putting baptism inside the Great Commission uh, it's interesting that sometimes, and you may get this when you study with some people, sometimes people will talk about baptism and they will refer to baptism as the first work that a Christian does. If somebody's already a Christian, they're already saved, and the first work, the first good work that they need to do as a Christian is they need to be baptized. They'll talk about baptism as an act of obedience that an, individual do, that an individual does, but it is not essential for salvation. It's just an important thing to do in order to obey God. Is that the context? Is that what Jesus is saying here about baptism? If that was the case, then why did Jesus single it out? right here why didn't he put some other and, and we're, we're going to ask this question in some future lessons too because we're going to make this same point on some future lessons why did jesus single something out if you're going to single anything out why baptism but if he does single it out if he does pull baptism and say here is something that that is important enough for me to mention specifically then who are we to come along and to take it out Victor? Yep, yep, absolutely. And, and, and we're, we're going to talk about that and, and how, how Jesus deals with that specifically about who, and, and to who Victor is talking about uh, that uh, somebody needs to be baptized. But if, if a Christian is to do other good works and is to do other acts of obedience, why pick this one out? What, what is Jesus indicating for us in this? But notice also that Jesus distinguishes baptism from the all things down in verse 20. 
What does he say in verse 20? He says, okay, you're going to go, verse 19, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Well, does Jesus command us to be baptized? Yes. So could baptism have just been a part of the all things down in verse 20? Just lump it in with the all things down there. Could have done that, but he doesn't. Instead of lumping it in with the all things for Christians to observe, he pulls it out. He distinguishes it from all other things that individuals are to... And, but why does... Uh, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that baptism alone by itself is the only thing somebody has to do. But what I'm saying is it's significant that Jesus points this out. Same thing when you get over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. Think about, and, and we, we, talked about this, we talked about this last week, or, or last time, three weeks ago. There are seven ones mentioned in Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Seven ones. There's one God, there's one Lord, there's one Spirit. Can you control any of those? Are, those any, of, do you, are any of those your actions? No. There's, there, there's one hope, there's one faith. But here in this list of things that there are ones, he says there's one baptism. Why does he mention baptism? I mean, why didn't he say there's one Lord's Supper? He could have said that, right? One Lord's Supper. There, there's one bread, there's one cup. Why does he pick out baptism? That, that, uh, you, that, you may think that's, that's not all that significant, but it is, it is when you start reading through and say, of all the things he could have chosen to talk about, that's the one he did. When, when Philip preached to the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8 and verse 35 tells us what his sermon was about. It only tells us one word about his sermon. You remember what he preached unto him? Jesus. We have a one-word summary of Philip's sermon to the Ethiopian. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, he preached unto him Jesus. What did the Ethiopian want to do in the very next verse? He wanted to get baptized. Why of all the things for God to point out to us that the Ethiopian wanted to do, why of all things does God point out baptism? Because God singles this out. Again, I'm not saying it's the only thing, but for when you get into discussions with individuals who do not believe that baptism has a part in a person's salvation, if that's true, why does God continually single it out? Now, I want to look at a couple things here about the grammar, about the word, and, and I know if I, if I say the word grammar, I just turned off like half of you, because you're like, oh, this ain't English class. Uh, don't be talking about no grammar in here. Uh, I don't want no English class. Well, there's some interesting things to see and some things that are very informative and instructive to us when we look at this. This may, th at first, this is not going to mean perhaps anything to you, and that's not, I'm not, that's, that's not putting anybody down, that's just a reflection of we don't, most of us don't study the Greek language. New Testament was originally written in Greek. This passage Jesus spoke was originally written in Greek, and he tells them to go and make disciples of all the nations, but the word baptizing that Jesus uses here is in the Greek it is a present tense participle, and you say, okay, do I have to know that to go to heaven? No, you don't have to know that to go to heaven. But let me share with you some things. Remember, there are a lot of folks who do not believe that baptism has anything to do with becoming a Christian, with being saved. Do I need to be baptized in order to be made a disciple? Remember what we said in the beginning. Make disciples is the leading verb of this sentence. It's the main verb of this sentence. The participle, well, let me just share this with you. What does a Greek participle do? Let me share with you three quotes, and th these are from Greek scholars. These are not from Church of Christ preachers. Oh, no, 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 these are from Greek scholars who know about the language. What does a Greek participle do? The Greek participle indicates the manner in which the given action is performed. Think about that. The manner in which a given action. What is the given action? Main verb, make disciples. 
What is the manner in which the given action is performed? The Greek part, the present participle shows you. Present participle says, how is that action performed? Through baptism. That's what the present participle indicates. Present participle indicates action taking place at the same time as the action denoted by the leading or the main verb. So simultaneous, same time as the main verb happens, the present participle is happening. Same time that the present participle happens, it's the manner in which the main verb happens. What does that tell you? What does that tell you about the place of baptism in becoming a disciple? Jesus says, go and make disciples. If I were to ask the question, how? Would the question, how, say, in what manner? How does somebody become a disciple? Jesus is telling us, here is how someone is made a disciple. Here is the manner in which, here is something that takes place at the same time as the main verb in order for that to happen. And Jesus says, it's baptism that does that. Let, 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 that, let that just sink in. Let that sink in for a minute. And you, you might say, boy, that's, that's awfully technical. That's really technical. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can follow that. We follow that all the time. We, 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 we may not use a, a Greek imperative followed by a Greek present participle, but we do this all the time, telling somebody to do, to do something and then telling them how to do it, sometimes using ing words after that. Go and, go and clean the car. Washing the outside, vacuuming the inside. What does that indicate? When somebody goes and they wash the outside and they vacuum the inside, what have they just done? They've just cleaned the car, which was the leading verb of what they were told to do. Go clean your room, putting your toys away and putting your dirty clothes in the laundry. What do they do if they put the toys away and put the dirty clothes in the laundry? They've just cleaned their room, which is the leading verb of what you told. We, we, we do this all the time. The, the, those ing verbs just explain how the first is to be accomplished and that is exactly what a present tense participle does in the greek language but here's the deal and and here's here's what we've got to understand is that because <laughs> do you think jesus knew like greek imperatives you think jesus knew he was using a present tense participle you think jesus was smart enough to know he was using that kind of language the very fact that jesus used a present tense participle will not allow, it will not allow baptism to take place after the main verb. The language just does not allow it. The grammar, it is impossible for the baptizing to take place after the main verb of making a disciple. The language will not allow it. This isn't, this isn't Church of Christ doctrine. This is just what does the verse say? And the verse says, in order to be made a disciple, someone must be baptized. Is that clear? I, it, it, to me, that just opens up even more to say, yes, baptism is essential for someone to be saved and to become a disciple. Now, is it, is it essential for somebody, in order to become a Christian, is it essential for somebody to be baptized? Can I be a Christian before I'm baptized? Can I be a Christian if I haven't been baptized? Somebody says this verse isn't talking about Christians. This verse is talking about making disciples. Well, what, what, is, what is a disciple? Here's, again, just Greek definitions of what the word disciple means. A disciple can, can be one of these two things. It can be both but can be a one of these two things. One who engages in learning through the instruction of another, and so that would be called a pupil or an apprentice, somebody who learns from another. And that may be one way that we've looked at the word um, disciple before, but, but more likely it's being used in this sense that one is rather constantly associated with someone who has a particular set of views, and so this would be somebody who has, is an adherent, not just somebody who's learning from another person, but somebody who is a follower, this is how uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary defines the disciple, is someone who follows another's teachings. So, would you say 
that a disciple is the same thing as a Christian. Would you say a disciple is the same thing as a Christian? Somebody who is a follower of Christ, who adheres to his teachings, would you say that that is a Christian? Well, the good thing is, it doesn't matter what we say, right? The good thing is, our opinion on that particular question doesn't really matter. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. You know what Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 says? The disciples were first called what, Chuck? Christians. Christians at Antioch. Is a disciple of Christ the same thing as a Christian? Same thing. And it's not, it, it's not our opinion about it. That's Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. The disciples were first called Christians. We, we don't have time to go into an in-depth study of that word called there. There's some... There's some individuals that have indicated they, they have thought that was a term of derision that man was using towards the disciples. And as a term of derision, they were calling them Christians. And that uh, the, the Greek word for called there will not allow that. It is a word that was specifically used in a divine sense, not, not a horizontal sense of derision, but a vertical divine sense that God was the one who called them Christians there. So the disciples were given a name in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 by God and that name is Christian. So whatever manner somebody, whatever manner is used in order for one to become a disciple in Matthew 28 and verse 19, whatever manner is used for someone to be made a disciple is the same manner in which somebody is made to become a Christian. Remember those definitions of a present participle? Present participle is the manner in which the main leading verb is accomplished. So when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples, in essence, Jesus is saying, go therefore and make Christians. Same term, it's used, used synonymously. How is someone made to become a Christian? Well, again, I am not saying, nor does the Bible say, nor is Jesus saying, the only thing that is required is for somebody to be baptized. But why does he pull that one out? Does, is, does, is, is faith required? Is repentance required? Is confession of faith required? All of those are required. Is baptism required? By Jesus pointing it out, it very much is required. Uh, look just very quickly, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and, and I only have about a minute to do this, so, so uh, grab this quick. I know you've heard this before, but Paul just nails this, and he's making the same point here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 12, he indicates that certain Christians in Corinth were saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. I wear the name of Paul, I wear the name of Apollos, I wear the name of Cephas, I wear the name of Christ. Okay, he says in verse 13, if you're going to wear the name of Paul, two things are required. One, Paul had to be crucified for you. Two, you had to be baptized in the name of Paul. And he says, if both of those factors are true, you can wear the name of Paul. So was it proper for any of them to say that they were wearing the name of Paul? No. Paul had not been crucified for them. They had not been baptized in the name of Paul. They could not be a Pauline. They could not be a Paulite. They could not be a whatever you want to call a follower of Paul. But what's his point? If I want to wear the name of Christ, two things have to take place. Same two things. Christ would have had to have been crucified for me, and I would have to be baptized in the name of Paul, or in the name of Christ. Was Christ crucified for me? Done. Have I been baptized in the name of Christ? Only if those two things are done can I wear the name of Christ and be called a Christian. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, is, is emphasizing the same point that Jesus is emphasizing in Matthew chapter 28, that in order for one to be a Christian, to wear the name of Christ, it is required that person must be baptized. Let me briefly mention this. I want to, I want to save enough, point, enough time uh, for the last point. But let me just briefly mention this, uh, this fourth point. Uh, the baptism that we read about in the Great Commission was a baptism that was humanly administered. We talked about this a little bit three weeks ago. We talked about the various baptisms that the New Testament talks about. The disciples were told, go out and make disciples 
and you make disciples by immersing people uh, in water. And so the discussion that is taking place in this verse is a baptism that can be and is administered by man. Therefore, it is not Holy Spirit baptism. If somebody tries to get you to think that this is Holy Spirit baptism in this verse, it cannot be. Because Holy Spirit baptism was only administered by Jesus himself. And yet Jesus is telling these individuals, go and baptize people. Something that they could only baptize somebody in water. They, they, were, they did not have the power. Only Jesus had the power to baptize somebody in water. And so here's something that I think is interesting for you to kind of hang on to. In the baptizing process... Who is the active one in the baptizing process? The active person in the baptizing process is the one who is doing the baptizing, is the baptizer. That's, and that's why every verb, like Jesus uses, baptizing them. We noted it was a present participle. It is in the active voice, which means it was an action they were to do. Who is, a, who is passive? In the baptizing process, the one who is getting baptized, they stand there, they are lowered down, they are picked back up, they are passive in that process. Sometimes people will accuse us of teaching that baptism is a work. You ever heard that? Baptism's a work. We're not saved by works. They've got a total misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches about uh, faith and works, but they will accuse us of teaching that baptism is a work. Well, call it whatever you want. Is baptism a work? Sure, it is. Is it a work of faith? Sure. Am I passive in it? Yes. What I find interesting is Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 teaches that baptism is the working of God. So there's an active person, the baptizer. There's a passive person, the one being baptized. But who's doing the work? God is. Because the work is not about water, the work is about salvation. The work is about the blood of Jesus saving us. And who's doing that? Uh, that'd be God. God's doing the work. God's saving us. Dirk? According to the Bible, he's sovereign. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, according to the Bible, you are dead and you are being buried. And that's why Romans chapter 6 says, it, it uses a passive vo voice there talking about being buried. When was the last time somebody buried themselves? I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about on the, on the beach in the sand. You may have done that uh, before. But uh, th those who are dead cannot bury themselves. And so uh, the baptism that is here talked about is a humanly administered baptism. God is doing the work in saving us. And this is a baptism that was to continue until the end of time. Holy Spirit baptism was not a baptism that was to continue until the end of time. All right, we've got a few minutes and uh, Victor alluded to this a little while ago uh, in his comment. But here is another thing for you to see that I think is very intriguing. If you just look at what the text says. The American Standard that, that was printed in 1901, American Standard Version is one of the only translations that takes this text and translates, if you look at this, go ye therefore, he says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Most of your translations, King James, New King James, New American Standard, ESV, are all going to have the word in there, I-N. The old American Standard has the word into, and somebody says, does that really make a difference? Well, does it make a difference? Uh, it is a different word. The Greek word that is used here is a different word than we read in other verses about being baptized in the name of. Uh, such as Acts chapter 10 and verse 48, where Peter commanded them, the, the, uh, the Gentiles in Acts 10 and verse 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's a different word than the word that's used here. Typically, when you read that baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, with that Greek word in, and we put it in English letters there, E-N. Um, typically, that is talking about being baptized 
uh, by the authority of Christ, baptized in the name of Christ. Sometimes we've used the illustration of, of uh, I, I don't guess they do it anymore, but uh, police officers coming to the door, and on old television shows they did it, you know, knocked on the door, open up in the name of the law. What does that indicate? By the authority of the law, you open the door. That's how that's being used in other, in other passages. Um, and certainly Jesus would say here in Matthew chapter 28, is baptism by his authority? Well, yeah, because in verse 18 he says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. But there's something different here. Um, there's something different here than just in the name of Christ. Something different here than just doing it by his authority. Because by the fact that this Greek word ace is being used, and we're going to talk more about that word when we get to Acts chapter 2, but the very fact that that word is being used, what it does is it indicates a change of relationship. Just think about the word into. If you translate it into, what does that indicate? That you are going from the outside to the inside. How did you get from the outside to the inside? You went into. You were out before, but now you are inside because you went into. That's what the Greek word ace indicates, is a change of relationship, a change of fellowship between two entities. And you say, well, I'm not really sure that's what it means. Let me share with you some Greek scholars and what they teach and what they have written about this word. And again, I, I, I don't want to keep over, I don't want to overemphasize this. For whatever reason, some folks believe that, that uh, the teaching of baptism is, as essential for salvation is something that's unique to the church of Christ. Well, that may be, but it doesn't make it some church of Christ doctrine as they want to call it. And so none of these scholars are members of the church of Christ. They are just individuals that look at the language. And so Beasley Murray in his book on baptism, here's what he said. He said, baptism in the name of the Father, as, as it's being used in Matthew 28, sets the baptized in a definite relation to God. So before baptism, was this person in a definite relation? No, they were not in a relation with God. The most, uh, the most widely accepted Greek lexicon today says that the name of God's Son is given the candidate at baptism. Those who are baptized, and he's talking about the Greek word ace here. Those who are baptized become the possession of and come under the dedicated protection of the one whose name they bear. This guy doesn't believe that baptism is essential for salvation, but guess what he has to admit when he looks at the language? That it's at the moment of baptism where someone comes into the possession of God. In a, uh, there's a theological dictionary of the New Testament. It's a huge 10-volume set. Volume 1 of that where it talks about this particular word. It says, into the name, as it's being used in Matthew 28, 19, into the name was a technical term used of, in the world of Greek commerce to indicate the entry into the account that bears the name of the one who owns it. You put something into the account of somebody and now it bears their name and they own that thing. When is somebody put into the account of God to bear his name? when they're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Vine's Expository Dictionary, which many of you have a copy of at home. The phrase in Matthew 28, 19, baptizing them into the name, would indicate that the baptized person was closely bound to and became the property of the one and two whose name he was baptized. He does not believe. His theology will not allow him to... to his theology is he doesn't believe baptism is essential for salvation, but he's looking at the language... He says, here's what the language demands. That one is not in a relationship with, he's not the property of God until he is baptized. Alford's Greek Testament says, It is unfortunate that our English Bibles do not give us the force of this ace. It should have been in two, just as the American Standard has it. It should have been in two, like it is in Galatians 3.27. It imports an objective admission into the covenant of redemption, a putting on of Christ. And that's just five, there could be more that could be added to this, that would show that this little word ace indicates a completely new relationship that someone enters in. And you notice the words possession or property or ownership 
that were involved in these words. Somebody cannot be the possession of God, be the property of God, be owned by God, be in fellowship with God, be in a relationship with God, until, just according to the words in the verse, until that person is baptized. J.W. McGarvey, a brother in Christ that some of you would know from a century and a half ago, you probably got some of his commentaries in your library. The name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit means the combined authority of all the manifestations of God. To be baptized into this is to be brought to it. He that is baptized is brought into subjection by that act to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in consequence of this subjection, he receives the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do we learn from this, just this little word into, this little word ace? Until the moment that somebody is baptized into the name of the Godhead, that person does not belong to God. That person cannot take on the name of the Godhead. That person cannot call upon God as his Father, and that person is not in union or fellowship or relationship with God until he's baptized. Where do we get all of that? From that little word, into. That little word, ace. Baptism is the point at which that relationship changes. Baptism is the point at which somebody goes from outside of that relationship with God into the inside of that relationship with God. Is that, is that clear when you just look at what the... Instead of listening to what other people would, would, would have you to believe, what do these words say what do they mean? Here's what we've seen this morning, these five points from Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, baptism is singled out, given a unique place. Baptism, baptizing is used as a present participle, indicating that in order to be made a disciple, somebody has to be baptized. It is essential to become a Christian because those words disciple and Christian are synonymous. It is humanly administered. And baptism is something that is done into a new relationship and sometimes you might hear us say that when we're baptizing somebody here. You might hear us say we're baptizing you into a new relationship with. Where does that come from? Right here. That's what that little word into means. Baptism is absolutely essential in order to become a Christian, in order to be entering into a new relationship with God. So as we go through this study for these next several weeks, I'm going to add to this chart and we will fill up this chart, but we need to understand from a, from a biblical standpoint that if someone wants to become a Christian, if someone wants to enter into a relationship with God, that baptism stands between the sinner and obtaining those blessings. You, you, you cannot have them without being baptized. And we're not saying it's the only thing. Is faith required? Is repentance required? All of that is required. But isn't it interesting that God singles out baptism in the Great Commission? Anybody have any last thoughts, comments, questions? Bell's going to get us here in just a couple seconds. Mark it down. I finished 30 seconds early. I'll borrow that 30 seconds next week. Thank you all very much for your good attention this morning.